Right. Amen. You know, we ask special prayer for both families that have uh, said goodbye to family members uh, this week, and uh, especially uh, with the loss connected with these families. And uh, I'm going to say more about that. Yeah, remember the Schufer family especially, a lot of lost people in connection with that family. And um, I'll also be praying. Uh, I was asked that if I would do the funeral service Monday. And, and so I assure you this, the gospel will be presented uh, without compromise in simplicity. And um, pray that God will, by the power of his word, save souls. Amen. I, I'll tell you, I've had the privilege of leading people to the Lord by gravesides. Did you know that? And you may have had as well. You know, I had a young man to the Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, not a young man, a middle-aged man who'd been in rebellion to God all his life by his mama's graveside. Let me tell you something. Those prayers that go up before the throne of grace, they're continually before the Lord. And, and I'm telling you, God's able to save. I, I, listen, what we're singing about, I believe, because I'm saved. How about you? <laughs> I know God can save because I'm saved, and I'm not the same. If you'd known me before I was saved, you'd say, oh, my, he'd never make a a preacher, much less a Christian. But I'm telling you, God chooses the foolish things, confound the wise. Salvation is of the Lord. Let's stand in reference to the reading of God's holy word. And I know you've got to find your place. That's Revelation chapter number 22. I was going to start a new series this week. It's all laid out and prepared. But uh, how many of you know God has the final say so? And if God pulls the brake on anything, you just better follow the Lord. I've learned that the hard way. <laughs> I've tried to force a text on the Lord, and I'll tell you what, it was like trying to crank a car in the cold weather in, in the winter at 3 a.m. in the morning. It was like, rrr, rrr, rrr. it just wasn't going nowhere, and I've learned the hard way and had to repent, and uh, we just want to be obedient to the Lord. But God, over the last couple of days, has uh, reminded me through some of the circumstances that are not by chance uh, of a text that I need to preach frequently. Revelation chapter 22, verses 10 through 17 now, we know that John has received a tour of New Jerusalem, and the angel is still uh, giving or speaking to John in verse number 10, and he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. And the Lord Jesus inter interjects and says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without, outside the gates of that city are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. You may be seated. May God add his blessings to the reading of his holy word. I want to preach this morning on the final altar call. The Lord began to impress this passage upon my heart over the last few days because, as I said, I got the news Thursday morning that my great uncle had passed away. And, and the first thing, when I, when I hear news like that, you know, I, I begin to think, you know, what does it profit a man? And I'm not saying this about him in respect, but it's just God brings eternal truths to my mind continually. What shall it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? A few minutes later... Erin uh, Hagen texted me that her granny, uh, Kathy's mother, had gone to be with the Lord. And I began to think of certain scriptures. And then Friday morning, I was dealing with a man, uh, or actually, he, he was, we were corresponding by text, and he told me that his mother had passed away. And I told him I'd be praying for him. But let me tell you something in just a matter of hours, in two days, when you begin to get text after text after text about people leaving this world, I'll tell you, the Lord can get your attention in a hurry. My friend, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Unless the Lord returns in our lifetime, we're going to die physically, 
whether you're young or old, you're going to leave this world. It's hard for us to, to really grasp that concept or really embrace that reality when we're young, but whether you're young or old, you're going to leave this world sooner or later. You're going to leave this life, and it's only what you've done with Christ that actually matters on that day. Can I get a witness? You say, but I'm young. Let me tell you, young people are buried every day. You say, but I've got a clean bill of health. Well, let me tell you something. People with clean bill of health, health drop dead of heart attacks. You say, well, it'll be a while before I have to worry about that. Let me tell you something. You might uh, know your birthday, but you do not know your death day. You just don't know how old you are. I've heard people say, well, I've got many, many years left. You don't know that. Some of you that are 15, 16, you might be older than those that are 70. You say, what do you mean? Well, let me tell you, what determines your age or how old you truly are is by when you're leaving this world. If you're leaving this, this world this afternoon and you're 15, you're older than those that are 99 and might live a few more years. I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm just telling you that's reality. A young man walked into our church about seven years ago. I looked at my... My, I, I usually try to take notes on certain things that uh, I know over time what happens to your mind. And I look back through my notes uh, about a young man who walked in our church seven years ago for the first time on a Sunday night. He was in his 20s. Uh, he had actually never been in church. And I remember when I preached that night, God gave a pretty strong altar call. And I could see God dealing with that young man's heart. I saw him wrestling with God. He was clearly disturbed, but he would not make a move toward the altar. As everyone was leaving that night, he spoke with me at the door. And I remember him saying, Preacher, I really enjoy being here. I will see you uh, soon. I'll be back. And uh, I remember looking at him as he exited the doors and saying to him, I hope I see you again. I had no idea uh, how ominous those words were. Two days later, two days later, I received the devastating phone call that the young man had been killed in an accident. And when I got that call, I, re I can remember it specifically because I felt sick to my stomach. I knew the young man had missed his final altar call to Christ. How tragic and sad that is. Friends, the sober reality is that every man, woman, boy, and girl is going to receive eventually their final invitation to God, to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's frightening is that men spurn in a way, and they don't even have a clue when their last altar call will occur. That's why it's so crucial to come to Christ or to respond to His Word today in the present. We're never, ever encouraged to put things off. We have no guarantee of tomorrow, only the full boast of tomorrow. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Behold, now, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Let me tell you, that's going to be the message that I preach at the funeral. Today is the day of salvation. That message is always uh, God's message to every believer. We have no idea of the time that we have left. And it's so important, church, that we as Christians, that we don't lose our focus on souls. We like to assume that we'll have another opportunity to, to speak to our loved ones or our friends. We have no guarantee of that. And I'll tell you, if we're not trying to win people to Jesus, we're guilty of violating, guilty of disobeying our great commission. The great commission of the church is to go into all the world and preach the gospel. It is to, to make disciples, to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. To teach them all things, whatsoever Christ has commanded. We have that responsibility. And if we're not trying to win people to Christ, I want to tell you something. We're wasting our time on earth. If the whole purpose was just for us, of us being here is uh, just to, if we think it's just to enjoy the things of this life, we have lost sight of our true purpose. We're saved. That's, thank God we're saved, and if that's the end of it, God should take us on right now. We should forever be with the Lord right now. Just go on. But God's left us here for a purpose. You say, what's that? To win people to Christ, to take people to heaven with us. God wants to save souls, and we as His children need to feel the urgency like the old hymn writer said, to rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Because time is winding down for every person. Look around. Everybody in here, your time is winding down. And 
as far as humanity is concerned, as a whole, humanity, time is winding down. Just like the young man I spoke of, we have no idea how much or any amount of time that we might have left. In all reality, this could be the last message you ever hear. Now, let me ask you a question. If this was going to be the last message you ever heard, would you sit up a little straighter? Would you be a little less distracted? Would you try to hang on to every word that God had to say? Well, you have no guarantee this is not. If you truly believe also as a believer that the Lord is coming back, then you know that God's final altar call for this world is drawing closer and closer. And so, boy, if we've ever... If there's ever been a time when we should be busy about the Father's business, it is today. We are in some late hours, I assure you of that. At God's appointed time, the day of grace will end, and men will have no more opportunities to repent of sin and trust in the Savior. Christians, we're encouraged by our Lord Himself to work while it is day. Why? Because the night cometh in a life and also in time when no man can work. Christians, we all must be busy about the Father's business, and the Father's business is about seeking and saving the lost. So this morning, I want us to get refocused on soul winning by looking once again at this final altar call that God gives to this world. This passage, I believe, if you study it and read it and internalize it, it helps you really reset on what's important, reboot, uh, just reprioritize. And it should also, if you're hearing your loss, it should warn you to come to Christ before it's too late. Now, in context, in the book of Revelation, in here, right here in chapter number 22, uh, the Revelation's about to be wrapped up, and the apostle John is going to pin down the final words that God has given to mankind. I know people pop up today and they have new revelations. Let me tell you, that's not the revelation of God. We have God's full revelation right here. And John's about to write down these final words that God's going to give to us in this dispensation. And what we find here in these final words in this closing section is a gracious invitation to sinners. And if you know anything about God, that should not surprise us. So let's begin in verse number 10, and we'll walk through this passage. The Bible says, And he, the angel, saith unto me, John, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Let me say, first of all, in verse number 10, we find a, a firm command. This is not a suggestion. This is not a, a just, a John, I, I would like for you to do this. This is a firm command from God delivered through his angel to seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. You say, what's going on? Well, John has received the revelation. I hear people say revelations. It's not revelations. There's one revelation because it's concerning one person, the revelation of Jesus Christ. He was given a command by this companion angel who's given him a tour and showed him many things that are to come. And this command was just the opposite, as you look at it, of the command that was given to Daniel. You remember back in the Old Testament, Daniel, after recording his vision of prophetic events to come, he was given a different command. In Daniel 8, 26, Gabriel says to Daniel, after the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told, or which was told is true, or and the vision of the of the evening and the morning, which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision. In other words, seal it, for it shall be for many days. It's not going to be revealed and unfolded for many days. It cannot be understood for a period of time. In chapter number 12 and verse number 4, later God said to Daniel, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. In other words, this was truth that really could not be, while Daniel was moved by it, it could not be fully understood. It wasn't time yet. With the beginning of the church age, let me tell you something, now it's opened up. The future events John saw could begin at any time. The last days began when the Lord Jesus Christ ha has come into this world. Of course, he's now with sin, but he's coming back. And because the future events that John saw could begin at any time, the angel says to John, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. In other words, these events are imminent. There's nothing left to occur before these things begin to unfold. 
The understanding of this revelation is no longer hidden or concealed, and so we must get the word out because souls and their eternal destinies are at stake. Let me tell you something, Jesus is going to return, and when he does, it's going to be too late for lost souls. According to the angel, we're not to keep this message sealed up to ourselves. John just didn't get a private revelation that he could tuck away and just go, hmm, I'm glad I know about this. I hate it for the world. No. He was to live with a sense of urgency to share the gospel, to share this prophecy. Why? Because the Lord's return is at hand. Church, we're called to be witnesses. We're called to call sinners to repentance of sin and faith in the Son of God. In Romans 10, 13, we've got that blessed hope and assurance that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, what does that mean when we begin to call people, witness to people, and tell them to call upon the name of the Lord? And, and if they do, they shall be saved. Well, to call on the Lord means to cry out. When you understand this biblically, it means to call out, to cry out in repentance of sin and faith in the Son of God for salvation. It's not just any old words. It's, it's really repentance of sin and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul taught the church, Acts 20, I believe it's Chapter number 20, verse 27, somewhere in there. Or 27, 20, I might have it backwards. And notice it says, for whosoever shall call upon the name, notice that, the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now that's important because in Bible times, a person's name, it's not just an arrangement of letters and sounds. No, a person's name represented that person. It, it represented who they are in character or something significant about them. To call upon the name of the Lord is to call and believe upon the Son of God as revealed by the Scriptures. It's to receive Him for who He truly is. You say, who is He? He is Lord God. Lord, that title, it conveys not only His sovereign authority and rulership, that's why we must bow and confess, but it also is a revelation of His deity. Lord in the New Testament is a translation of that old Hebrew word Jehovah, which is translated Lord. You see, saving is what the Lord does for sinners. Call upon the name of the Lord, and thou shalt be saved. That's what God does for sinners when they call upon the name of the Lord. But a sinner cannot be saved unless he, by faith, embraces the Lord for who he is. A lot of people today want what the Lord can do for them, but they don't want the Lord. Salvation is in a person. Saving is what God does when you call upon the name of the Lord, who he is. Calling upon the name of the Lord is embracing, embracing Jesus Christ as the Lord and the Savior of your life. That's who he is. If you want what he does, you've got to receive him for who he is. And here's where the problem arises for so many. Many sinners are willing to believe the facts about Jesus. They get emotional when they begin to think about their guilt and where they're headed. And they'll even accept a fire escape ticket from hell if you'll offer them one. But in their hardness of heart, they are unwilling to make Jesus Christ Lord. They're not willing to surrender the control of their lives. Their plan is to continue on with their life and live it as they please. They just want the, the assurance of salvation. They just want the, the ticket. They want a salvation apart from the lordship of Christ in their life. And that's why so many pray a prayer. I used to be confused about this as I grew up in the church, and I watched people walk the aisle and, and hang around a little while, and then they return like a, a dog to their vomit. And I couldn't understand this, but as I begin to get into Scriptures, the Lord makes it really clear. God's got all the answers. Look what happens whenever the Jesus taught in Matthew 13, whenever the sower he sow seeds, it falls on different types of soils, different types of grounds. Only one type of soil brings forth fruit and bears witness that it's true saving faith. And the Lord explains what happens to all those who fall away. They, they make professions of faith or they reject Christ. They depart over time. The sad reality is that people who think they're saved, many of them, especially in this part of the country, 
They have never sincerely by faith in repentance called upon the name of the Lord. They have never been born again, and their lives evidence it. The most frustrating thing I have dealt with as a pastor is trying to, when you get certain people to uh, make a profession of faith, boy, they close their mind off to anything else. They're done. You'll never tell them, no matter what the Word of God says. I've sat beside a bedside of a man dying who had hours to live and tried to show him the problem with his childhood profession. I, wanted, I, I can't see his heart, but I, I just was disturbed by his life. He made a profession as a child in, in a VBS, and then he went into sin and lived in sin. He was in the honky-tonks, and he lived just for business, and uh, he went from relationship to relationship, and there he lay dying, and I kept saying, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? What happened to your life beyond that experience? Where's the evidence? Where's the fruit? He wouldn't listen to me. He wouldn't listen to me. He said, because you can't make me doubt it. Amen. I know I said a prayer, and he had done the thing. He, 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 had, he, boy, he was committed and believed in the thing that God could do for him because he'd done the thing somebody had told him but he had not embraced the person, Jesus Christ. When you embrace the person, you get the Son. And when you get the Son, you get a Lord. When you get the Son, you get a Savior. You get a shepherd, amen. You get someone who will lead you, who will guide you, who will conform you, who will change you. People want a salvation apart from a Lord. It doesn't work that way. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, 19, Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Oh, preacher, but I know people who made a profession of faith, but they just don't live like it. Every, every, there's no gray areas with Christ. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit. The fruit is what, what comes naturally because of the nature of a tree. An apple tree doesn't think about, well, maybe I ought to start growing apples since I'm an apple tree. Let me tell you something. Fruit comes naturally because of the nature of the tree. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Let me tell you something. If you're saved by the grace of God, you might not bear as much fruit as, as others. Some may bear much fruit. Some may bear a lot of fruit. Let me tell you something. If you're saved by the grace of God, there will be some fruit. There will be fruit. Because every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. That's not talking about just being chastened, amen. Being cast into the fire is being cast into hell. And Jesus said, wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. In other words, where there is the new nature, where someone is truly born again, where someone is truly a child of God, that profession will be evidenced. That new nature will bear fruit. You see, words are cheap. Verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, those that are saved for the rest of their life, listen to me now, for the rest of their life, they're characterized by doing the will of God. They, listen, that's how they get saved, first of all, because they receive Jesus Christ. That's what God's commanded us to do, is repent and to believe in His Son. And listen, that just becomes the pattern of life, doing the will of God. And we just continue on. That's what happens in eternity. I was reading behind a preacher the other day. He said, why do people want to go to heaven that claim to be saved but live in rebellion to Christ? Why do they even want to go to heaven? Don't they understand that's what heaven is? Heaven's the continuation of doing the, the will of the Father. If you don't want to do God's will down here, why would you want to go to heaven? But if you're saved, you want to do the will of God. And that just becomes what we do flawlessly, without interruption in eternity. I know we fail the Lord. Don't get me wrong. I'm not preaching perfection by no means, but I'll tell you something. According to Jesus, those that enter the kingdom are those who do the will of the Father, or doeth as present tense, as perpetual. Words are cheap. Obedience to God characterizes believers. Verse 22, many will say to me in that day, I was told to write it down in my Bible in vacation Bible school. I got a certificate that says I got saved or I got baptized. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Why, we have been involved in ministry, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Let me tell you what they have. They have religion without reality. They have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Amen. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work 
iniquity, lawlessness. Your life is characterized not by doing the will of God. Here's the contrast. It's characterized by lawlessness. That's what iniquity is. You don't live in obedience to me. You just call me, Lord. Thank God for those who truly sorrow over their sins against God and repent of sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God there are a few, amen. Matthew 7, 14, Jesus said, Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. You see, it feels like we're in the minority. Well, according to Jesus, we are. If we're saved by the grace of God. And I don't mean that to be negative. I'm just preaching what Jesus says. I just accept what he says. Though only few will call upon the name of the Lord and find eternal life, I want you to know it's not God's fault. God in mercy extends the offer of salvation to all. It's still to whosoever will, amen. But here's the problem all sinners face, Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sinned? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. God says sinners have a problem. And here's the solution. They need the gospel. But let me tell you what stands in the way of that solution. It's you and I doing the Great Commission, being a witness. Getting back to the angel's message, you say, how does that tie into what we're talking about? Well, getting back to the angel's message, the angel says to John, the time is at hand. The time is near. In other words, these end-time events that are just around the corner and can begin to happen at any time, because it's at hand, you need to be expending all your energies and all your resources. You cannot keep this sealed up to yourself. You've got to get the word out, verse 10. And he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. That word sayings is important. It's the Greek word logos. Seal not the words, the, the word of God of the prophecy. God wants us to use his revelation. When we witness, we're to use his revelation, his words, not our opinions, not our clever arguments. We, we're not to use private interpretations. We're to expound his words to sinners. We're not to keep them sealed up and locked away from souls. That means you need to be in your Bible, right? Failure to share the truth, the word of the prophecy of this book, is to rob the unbelieving world of the power of God unto salvation. And it's to rob the world of the final warning of the coming wrath of God that he will serve upon this world. Let me tell you something. This world is lawless, and God is just, and God's going to, he's going to deal with sin. Don't you worry about what it seems like the world's getting away with. God's going to serve sin. It's the only reason God hasn't already executed final judgment is because he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Verse 10 in this chapter, though, is a gracious command to ensure that the written Word of God is not just uh, sealed up and concealed and kept to a few, but expounded and proclaimed to all. This is to happen not just in the pulpit. It's to happen in living rooms. It's to happen in break rooms. It's to happen uh, at work benches. It's to happen in lunch rooms. It's to happen in the neighbor's yard. It's wherever God gives us opportunity, in the highways, in the byways, and in the hedges. In verse 11... The angel says, he that is unjust. This is on the heels now, on the heels of the revelation, the word, the prophecy of this book, the revelation of Christ. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. What we find secondly is there is a fixed consequence in connection with the declaration and the proclamation of the word of God. This exhortation has confused a lot of people. They're confused by what the angel is saying. The angel's not saying, boy, if you're in sin, just keep sinning. And that's not what the angel is saying. The point here is simply that if people do not heed the prophecy, the Word of God, the revelation of Christ, they will be ultimately and permanently fixed in their sinful condition. How many of you know the revelation of Jesus Christ, the Word of God, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It's that which sets us free from sin. It, it cleanses us from sin. It, it makes us a new creature. And to ignore that is to be permanently fixed in a sinful state. Those who do not heed the Word of God, they will not be changed. 
Those who do heed it will be changed and continue to live righteously. Basically, there's two responses to God's Word. First, when God shares His message, His Word with sinners, some hearts are broken in repentance. Some are softened to receive the engrafted Word of God and believe on the Lord, while others resist it. They're hardened by it, and they refuse to repent of sins. And Paul spoke of these two responses of the truth as he was going about as a minister of righteousness, God's righteousness, proclaiming the gospel. He says as he would come in contact with people and preach and share the gospel of Christ, he says, for we are unto God a sweet savor, an aroma of Christ. Boy, we are a sweet savor of Christ unto God. Think about that. When you share the gospel, boy, there's a pleasant smell coming up from your life in the nostrils of God in them that are saved. Now, it's a sweet smell not only to God, but it's a sweet smell to those who are saved that respond in obedience to the Scriptures. But there's also a response, not that it's sweet unto them, in them that perish. There's two responses. Verse 16, to the one, we are the savor, the smell, the aroma of death unto death, and to the other, the savor of life unto life. In other words, the preaching of the Word of Christ will either bring great blessing to people, they'll be saved, and that becomes a sweet aroma to their soul, or those who do not receive God's revelation, those who won't receive the Word of God. The Word of God becomes to them an irritant to their soul. It's a repulsive smell. This exhortation informs us that man's response to the revelation of Jesus Christ, his response will ultimately choose and fix his eternal state. He that's unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he which is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. The unjust, wicked sinner who refuses to repent of sin and trust in Christ will be fixed in his impenitence. His will is crystallized. God says, you don't want my will to be done, your will will be done. And he is crystallized in his impenitence. That person spends eternity in the lake of fire. The wicked does cursing God perpetually in rebellion. The filthy, the morally corrupt, those who refuse to repent will be crystallized in their immoral condition when they die or when the Lord returns. In other words, for all of eternity, the drunk who dies a drunk, he'll spend eternity in hell craving a drink. The addict, their drugs, the sexually immoral, their acts, and the covetous in hell will want and continually want. There will be those sins will be a constant reminder of what they traded their souls for. The religious sinner who dies in religious pride will constantly cry out in hell with self-righteous pride that he's too good to be hell, that God's made a mistake, that he does not deserve such a sentence. The unjust will be unjust still. The filthy will be filthy still for all of eternity. They'll be fixed in that state. But the righteous... Those who are saved. Now, we're not righteous in and of ourselves. We're made righteousness, are made righteous. The righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, and we begin to practice that righteousness. Amen. We work out our salvation. The righteous, those saved and made righteous by the blood of the Lamb, will continue to live righteously in response to the Word of God throughout eternity. Thank God for that. There will be ongoing righteousness and holiness for all of eternity. I look forward to the day when this flesh is done away with once and for all, and I live in perpetual holiness without sin, without interruption of disobedience. Amen? Amen. If you're saved by the grace of God, you long for that day too. Oh, wretched man that I am, Paul said, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God for the Lord Jesus Christ who's going to do just that. In short, man's response to God's Word not only reveals whether or not he is truly saved, but it also determines his permanent condition for all of eternity. You want that drink. You want those drugs. You want those uh, immoral, illicit relationships over the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll get your heart's desire. You'll not get the satisfaction of it, but you'll get to live with those cravings. But if you want righteousness, if you want holiness, God will give you that too in Christ. But on the heels of this angelic command and this exhortation, Jesus says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. You say, what's going on? The Lord's foretelling his coming. He's coming. Amen. He's coming. 
Jesus says, in effect, to John and to all who will listen, behold, you better take heed. You better stay alert. You don't know the appointed time, but I'm coming, and it will happen quickly. It will happen suddenly. It doesn't mean that he wasn't saying I'll be coming in a few days. Quickly here means suddenly. It means when it happens, I'm telling you what, there will be no more opportunities to pray. There will be no, no more opportunities to come to an old-fashioned altar and confess sin and repent. When the Lord comes back, if you're not ready and right to meet God, you're out of, I shouldn't say luck because there's no such thing as luck, but you're out of chances. It'll be too late to do anything else. Jesus talked about his sudden return, Matthew 24, 27, for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west. That happens quickly, doesn't it? You ever been driving down the road during a thunderstorm and all of a sudden the sky just light up and it just catches you off guard? That's the way the coming of the Lord will be. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In verse 42, watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Verse 43, but know this, that if the good man of the house, the strong man of the house, had known in what watch, what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered or allowed his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is faithful and wise servant? God's people ought to be faithful and wise. Whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season, their reward in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find him, shall find doing so. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming. Oh, he's not coming any time soon. He shall begin to smite his fellow servants. He gets careless with how he treats people. And to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he's not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. That guy who begins to get slack, thinking, boy, I've got time to repent, he proves that he's lost, and he'll get his portion with the hypocrites. What's that? Hell. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Friends, I want to tell you something. The king is coming again. The king is coming just as he has promised. The Lord of heaven and earth will return, and he's going to render final judgment upon this world. He, Jesus Christ, will have the last and final say. I don't say that to scare you. I want to stress that I'm not trying. He's, trying to, he's a scary preacher. No, this is what the Word of God teaches. I'm just responsible to tell the truth. Oh, preacher, we want to hear a feel-good message. Tickle our ear. Tickle our fancy. Oh, no, I'm just going to tell you the truth. I've got to stand before the Lord one day. I don't know when my last sermon's going to be either. And so we're to stay alert and be faithful to his calls because Jesus said that he's coming with his reward to give to every man according to his works. At the end of verse 12, look again, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. And I like to say all the time, I don't want to stand beside the apostle Paul in the rewards line, amen? What a faithful man of God. But we ought to be striving to be faithful, to have rewards in heaven. You say, why is that? Well, I'll explain. But here we're reminded that Christ will demonstrate his faithfulness, not only in his return to his people. He's going to demonstrate his faithfulness in coming back for his church. But we also see his faithfulness here in the rewarding of their works. You see, according to Hebrews 16, the Bible says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Let me tell you something. When you do something for the Lord Jesus Christ with the right motivation for his honor and his glory, God sees that. Let me tell you, there will be a lot of things that those of us who are, who are serving the Lord and living for Christ, we've forgotten about. But the Lord hadn't forgot about a single one of those incidents. He's not unrighteous to forget our works in labor of love. The believer's eternal reward will be based on his faithfulness to Christ in this life. That's why we must live every day faithfully for him and share his gospel continually. And, and, and according to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, verses 9 through 15, our works will be tested. They're going to be uh, figuratively put through the fire to see what comes through, what's burned up, what lasts. They're going to be tested to see whether they're good or bad. 
And only the works that pass the test of God's fire, his thorough examination will merit reward. Those whose works don't pass the test, maybe the motivation was wrong, maybe they were, they were in the wrong spirit in how they served the Lord or, or whatever. If their works don't pass the test, they'll suffer loss of reward. You say, is that a big deal? Yes, it's a big deal. Do you want to have anything to lay at the feet of Jesus Christ? That's my motivation. I want to have something to lay at his feet after all that he's given to me. But let me tell you, beyond that, the reward a believer either receives or suffers loss of will determine his capacity for serving God throughout eternity. What you're entrusted with is directly proportional to what passes through the fire of God's judgment. What you're faithful over, how you use the opportunities and talents that God's given you, will dictate how you experience, or how you, or to what degree you are entrusted to serve God throughout eternity. Uh, one's faithfulness dictates his opportunity. The greater one's faithfulness in this life, the greater their opportunity will be to serve Christ in heaven. I say that because you need to understand that the way you live for Christ, the way you serve Christ, it has eternal implications. I know a lot of people have the, the impression that I'm saved, nothing else matters. Oh, yes, it does. The way we live for Christ and serve Christ right now till we leave this world has a direct impact on our experience in heaven. I wish I had time to take you through the passages where Jesus spoke of that, but I don't. But uh, that's one of the reasons John said this in 2 John 1.8. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. John says, in effect, believers, watch yourselves. Guard yourselves. Look to yourselves so that you don't lose what you have accomplished, but that you might receive a full reward. Now, let me ask you something. Did you know that you can serve Christ for a while and then lose the reward of what you could have obtained? by not holding to the truth, by not staying disciplined, by not finishing well. That's the suffering of loss. That's why we have to guard our lives and stay faithful and hold to the truth, lest we not receive a full reward to lay at Jesus' feet. And then in verse 13, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and Omega. Those are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. It's the A and Z of the Greek al alphabet. The beginning and the end, the first and the last. We see here the first and the last, his credentials. Maybe you're wondering what exactly the Lord Jesus is saying with these multiple titles. Let me tell you just in, in short, he's saying, I am God. I am God. Alpha is the first letter, as I said, of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the, the last. In other words, I am God. I am the beginning and the end. Understand, he's not talking about just the alphabet. He's saying who he is. He's revealing who he is in reality. Jesus Christ is the absolute beginning and the absolute end of all things. He was, he is, and he forever will be. Everything that is ultimately originates with him, and everything ultimately will culminate, will end with him. Paul says it this way in Romans eleven thirty six: 36, For of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. Why should a man take the revelation of Jesus Christ seriously? I'll tell you why. Because he was created by Christ, for Christ, and is destined to stand before Christ. The titles of Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, confirm Jesus' deity. But it also clarifies his right to judge mankind and rule over creation for and throughout eternity. Why? Because it's his creation. <laughs> it's of him, for him, and through him, and to him. That's why to miss out on Christ, to miss out on his salvation, is the greatest tragedy in life because he's the purpose of it. He's the originator. He's the consummation of life. And to live for any other purpose or pursuit or pleasure other than that of Christ, that's foolish. He is God, our maker. He is life eternal. He is the beginning and the end. I know people want to live their lives many times ignoring this God, but let me tell you something. They're on a collision course for meeting him. You don't get away from this God. And this is the record that God hath given to us, eternal life, 1 John 5, 11. 
and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. The angel continues in verse 14, Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Now we see the faithful's compensation. Now, let me just, if you read the whole book of Revelation, you know that this language in this verse borrows from chapter 7 where we learn that believers through obedience to the gospel, they have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. We're not talking about people earning their way to heaven. These people in the same language of chapter 7, they have, they have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. And building upon that truth, we find here that those who are genuinely saved, those who have truly been washed from sin in the blood of Christ, are those, I like this in verse number 14, they are those who do the Lord's commandments. It's those people, those who do the will of God. It's they that will live forever and have right to the tree of life. Now, like I said, this verse doesn't teach that we work our way to heaven, but rather that works and obedience to Christ's commands, they are the fruit and the proof of real, genuine salvation. Only true believers... Those characterized by obedience to Christ, as John would say, those that do His commandments, they have access to the tree of life and to the eternal city. Now, the tree of life is located in the capital city of heaven, the new Jerusalem. It's right there in the heart of the city. And so this speaks of the glorious privilege of being in the intimate presence of God and enjoying intimate fellowship. This is the full, full fulfillment of Jesus' promise in Revelation 2, 7. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Who are the overcomers? They're true believers. 1 John 5, 4. It's their faith that overcomes the world. True believers are those that do God's will. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Those that do the will of the Father. Their lives are marked by faith and obedience, and they trade their lives, their sins, and this world's comforts and sensual pleasures for Christ and His righteousness. And they are the wise ones, according to Scripture, because the compensation for that trade is eternal life and entrance into the midst of God's paradise and presence. There they'll be with the Lord forever. Listen up. Heaven is exclusively for those who have been cleansed from their sins by the blood of the Lamb. By grace through faith, they have been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Their names are written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, chapter 13 and verse 8. In contrast, unbelievers, those who wanted their lives of sin instead of the Lord Jesus Christ and His righteousness, they will never be granted entrance into God's holy city, much less the paradise of God. Instead, they will forever remain outside the gates of heaven, banished to the lake of fire. So let's talk about that forbidden congregation. Now, we're given a list of people who will not have access into that city. Verse 15, for without, outside the gates of New Jerusalem, are dogs. Now, I'm speaking figuratively, a dog in that day was repulsive. Wild dogs is the picture here. Those that, that dig through the city's dump and garbage trying to find things to eat. No standards, just uh, vile. Here at first are those of low character. They seek after the filth of this world to satisfy their fleshly appetites. They are base sinners. They're unclean souls. Not only are there dogs outside the gate, but they're sorcerers and sorcerers. The Greek word here is pharmakia. It's where we get our word pharmacy. It's speaking of those who use not only just those that dabble in the occult, but also those who dabble in drugs. It can speak of drug users. And by the way, the occult, demonic spirits, and that activity goes hand in hand with drug use. And whoremongers. The Greek word here is pornos. We get our word pornography from it. Here are first of those who are sexually immoral, those who engage in any kind of sexual activity, those whose hearts are, in their heart, they're just fornicators at heart. And murderers, those that take life, but according to Jesus and according to 1 John 3, 15, those who can live with hatred in their heart are murderers. And idolaters, those who choose to worship something other than the Lord Jesus Christ, so, those who choose to worship even another Jesus. You know, in 2 Corinthians 11, 4, Paul talks about another Jesus. Satan's ministers come in, they preach another Jesus and another gospel. They, they reinvent a Jesus that, that suits their own lust and their own desires. He doesn't really demand repentance of sin. He don't really produce holiness, kind of lets you do your own thing, but he gives you the fire escape ticket. That's an idol, my friend. It's the creation of, a, of another Jesus. 
And whosoever loveth and maketh a lie, those who live in deception, deal with deception, those who refuse to walk in truth and come to truth. Basically, there's two categories of souls, those on the inside of heaven's gates and those on the outside. Those on the inside are sinners who have been saved from sin. They've been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Those on the outside are sinners who wanted to keep their sins and live in them. Let me say it this way. People on the inside wanted the Lord Jesus Christ more than they wanted their sin and their own will. People on the outside wanted their sin more than they wanted the Lord Jesus Christ. And God ultimately gives a man his wish. Those on the outside of the gate get to keep their sin in the lake of, the, lake of fire. But let me tell you something. Those who go into that city, you don't get the Savior and want to hang on to your sin. Christ came to save sinners from their sin. Isn't that what the angel said to Joseph, Matthew 1, 21? And she shall bring forth a son, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from hell. That's what we just want to believe. No, let me tell you, real salvation saves you from your sins. Are you truly one of his people? Tell me your attitude towards sin. Tell me your attitude about obedience to the Savior, and I'll tell you what it says. What have you chosen? What do you want supremely? Do you want your life, your will, your desires, your sin, your life? Or do you want Christ, His righteousness, and His will? Dear friend, this is God's gracious altar call. Let's wrap it up, verses 16 and 17. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you the things, are these things in the churches? I am the root and the offspring of David. The root and the offspring of David. I love that. As to his deity, Jesus is David's creator. He's the root of David. David come from him. <laughs> As to his humanity, he's David's descendant. He's the offspring. He's the rightful heir to sit upon the throne of David. But he's also the bright morning star. There, there's a Jewish connotation in the first part. There's a, a, a church connotation here. And the bright morning star. The morning star appears in the sky during the darkest part of night. Shortly before, before the sun rises. In other words, the dark, the dark part of our history is going to be the tribulation period. Shortly before the sun rises, in other words, Christ will appear to his church as the bright morning star. Before the real darkness of night, the tribulation period, we call that the rapture. Later, after the seven-year tribulation period, that dark period, Christ will return to the earth, according to the book of Malachi, as the sun. The sun comes after the full night of darkness, as the sun of righteousness with healing in his wings. In verse 17, because God is gracious, because this is what's coming, here's the wonderful invitation. And the Spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. What we see here, we see the final call. The final call. The most wonderful word, a holy God, who, whose eyes are so pure and holy cannot look upon sin without judging it. The most wonderful word, a holy God, could speak to hell-deserving, unclean, rebellious, Wicked sinners is the word come. We shouldn't have the right, and we don't, apart from Christ, we don't have the right in our sinful filthiness to approach this holy God. And God has opened the veil in the person of Christ. His body was broken. His blood was shed to open up the way so that God can say, come. This is God's invitation. One day that final invitation comes. God's going to wrap up time, and it might be, this might be your final invitation. If you're saved, I want you to understand, listen, we need to live a holy, separated life, and we need to be bidding sinners come because time is running out. If you're lost, today's the day of salvation. What in the world do you want to hang on to and trade your soul for? What sin? What, what sinner in hell today is sin? Boy, I'm so glad I hung on to my drink and my drugs and, and my sexual immorality and my pornography. What sinner in hell is saying, oh, I'm so glad I hung on to my pride and my religion. What sinner is saying that? It's dawned on them they traded their souls for that which is filthy, worthless, and temporary. Today's the day of salvation. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.